Jensen Wong brushed those shoulders off. NVIDIA crushes earnings again. Is Elon going to take Trump with him to space? SpaceX is preparing a tender offer valuing the company next month at over $250 billion. And also, what's going on with Gen Z and AI tools? They're using those to uh, improve their side hustles. I'm Justin. I'm joined with my good friend, TW. We're two non-technical guys uh, who've been in tech over 30 plus years. We work with companies like Twitch, Microsoft, Zynga, Discord. And we're really just here to provide easily digestible lens of the tech industry and talk about our experience based off of building a career in Silicon Valley. Uh, let's jump into these news headlines for the week. All right. Three, two, one, go! All right. So, you know, NVIDIA's earnings came out uh, a few days ago. They crushed it. Earnings per share, 81 cents, beating the consensus of 75 cents. Revenue over 35 billion, surpassed the consensus view of 33 billion. And then they have a Q4 sales forecast of, you know, 37.5 billion in Q4, which would be 70% year over year growth. I mean, this company is just. It just continues to crush and, you know, do better than anyone's kind of wildest imagination. In terms of their revenue, you know, it rose 94% annually from the prior quarter. It's really fueled off of the explosion of, of demand for its AI-focused data center chips, um, especially the Blackwell chip launch. NVIDIA shipped 13,000 units of Blackwell AI chips to major partners like Microsoft and OpenAI which really marked the beginning of the chip's official, official launch into full production. And, you know, it looks like kind of there's really no bad news in sight for, for the company. Uh, gaming division also doing real, really well. Automotive revenue growing. If there are any challenges, you know, there are some constraints on potential hurdles with the U.S. administration and posturing towards, you know, countries outside of the U.S. But things are looking generally really good. Uh, it's at the center of the AI revolution. That's not going to change. And just another blowout quarter. So Tito, what do you, what do you think about, about NVIDIA? Are we at the top of the market? They still have room to grow? Where are we at? It's like we've said, we're not technical. So when I look at NVIDIA, like to me, I'm just taking this stuff for what it's worth in the, in the media and in articles, understanding the moat that they've built is, is incredible and large. And it's difficult for others to to create this. Why I'm not sure, frankly, like it seems very complicated, and I think you need to be pretty technical to understand what exactly they've built and why it's so scalable and so user friendly for these clouds and other things. I don't see an end to it. Every every analyst talks about it, which kind of freaks me out. Obviously, it's one of those things where you know you should be scared when everybody else is so bullish, but the thing keeps going up. So I. No, I don't know. Like, is, is there any end to this AI coming and more reliance yeah. on NVIDIA forever? I don't know. What are your thoughts? I think that, and, and I'm actually, you know, it'd be great to have your perspective on this as well. I kind of liken it to that 2000s period, although, you know, not that I was fully in the workforce there, but obviously have some context. But I feel like the difference between that time, kind of that dot-com era and now was, you know, these, these companies were soaring off of just owning a URL as opposed to kind of real technology or real value that's created a trend that's going to change consumer behavior forever. And the other companies that are, that are out there are just super far behind in terms of dominance in the market and how complex you know, their chips are and the, and the insights and kind of the, the learnings that NVIDIA has had from all these decades in kind of the gaming space which provides kind of the, the understanding of how to design those chips for these data centers. So, I don't think that I don't think that's something that could be supplanted really easily. I think they're going to own the lion's share of the market for the long time, and even if they do lose some share, they're still going to be still going to be printing money. And you know, I'm using these tools, so I think it's still I think it's still bullish. I think it could pull back a little bit, but even if it does, relative to how well it's performed, I think it can still make some money. It may not be as outsized though. Yeah, you talk back. In the dot com era, it was very much 
Cisco, Sun Microsystems, those sort of like stackable units that everyone was going crazy over because, you know, you wanted the connection, you wanted live data accessible all the time. And it seems like now, not only do you need that data, you need processing power and you need chips to actually do complex things on the fly and scale within all of these different CPUs. So, like, I, it all sounds great. I, I have no idea how it actually works. But uh, theoretically, it sounds like this is here to stay for a while, like you said, because more companies, more people are relying on AI, and they're not doing, they're not housing it in their in their you know, data centers. Just stuff is done in the cloud and brought it back. It's incredibly complex. There are security issues and all kinds of things tied to it. So, I guess it's not a surprise that the moat is so big for Nvidia. I'm kind of in a wait and see mode to see where it goes, but like I I'm in it as well. Like this is seems like a real opportunity here. Yeah. And I think the pie just continues to grow. And additionally, like there was news that came out today about Amazon investing four more billion dollars in Anthropic. I'm not sure if you if you saw that and them using AWS like that is all towards this trend. And so, you know, as long as you have these major players continuing to invest here and spend dollars, that's I, I think, you know, it, it rises all tides. So, you know, obviously we'll continue to stay close to this. If anything does change, obviously not financial advice, but we'll give you the updates on the news and our opinions. But things things looking really good for Jensen, man. I'm, we're gonna have to wear a, a leather jacket next time we talk about yeah, Nvidia. Sure. I mean, we got the same last name. Maybe I should need to do like one of those me twenty three things. Yeah, you got to do the twenty three and me, man. Yeah. For sure, <laughs> get some of that Nvidia bread going. Hey, listen, if you get some of it, swing it over to me, man. Yeah, you know, sure, share it over. Do, doing way more than Bart has. I know, right? Um, why don't we get into some of the other news? So, so SpaceX, there's some news around their their tender offer, which, uh, you know, essentially they're preparing for next month, which allows the sale of some second of some shares, I think, on the secondary market that would value the company at over 250 billion. Interestingly, you know, Musk doesn't seem to be as interested in pursuing an IPO, and he cites kind of the pressure of short term results for, for public companies and not wanting to kind of get into into that right now. But he's in a, you know, SpaceX is in a really good place right now, particularly with Elon's relationship with Trump and with Doge and the new kind of agency that he's, he's forming with Vivek and really, you know, strengthening his, his relationship with the new administration. And so SpaceX, their star, starship is central to NASA's Artemis program, which essentially aims to return humans to the moon you know, and it's also going to be a stepping stone for potential Mars missions down the line. And that could become like a, a goal of priority for the U.S. government, too. So I think that's really that's really interesting. But you can't talk about SpaceX without talking about Starlink as well. I mean, SpaceX controls two thirds of the satellites orbiting Earth. And that's really, you know, largely based on expanding its expanding Starlink network. And Starlink now connects over four million customers worldwide. So uh, a lot of a lot of really positive progress for for SpaceX for for Elon and obviously in a really good relationship in place with Trump. Obviously those things can change as we know over time with Trump and people who holds in favor but uh, you know some really good positive signals for them. Anything that kind of stands out for you with the news either SpaceX I mean, specifically or Starlink or the thing yeah. that I found interesting and in, in looking this up because it is fascinating like going like having people live in Mars and uh, I went down that rabbit hole apparently you can only make the trip once every two years um, because of the way the whatever stars align so you, for us to like capture the moment we can do it every two years so you, you know you're talking about him in this administration he's got two shots with Trump if he's going to really <laughs> be tied to this administration he's got two shots at this thing um, to, to make it happen I mean, I'm not saying he can't do it, but like it seems pretty scary, right? Like you've got one shot as a test, and then you're sending up humans after that. Like that's essentially you can't be wrong <laughs> in this yeah, instance. Yeah, like yeah. you literally need to nail this thing, which of course I think he can do it, but this is going to be a tight rope here because um, any delay, this is not this is not like Model Three being delayed a couple months. If you're a couple months behind, you're two years behind, right? So right, this right. is going to be uh, a real test you know, for 
all of these all of these things together can they pull, pull it in and and send people to mars we'll see that seems like an impossible task but you know what when, when he says something he, he generally does it so yeah i'm excited to see I'm, I'm not going to mars for sure that's not for me but that is pretty cool that that we could potentially be on a mission it was yeah it was actually funny because you were reading my mind a little bit i was going to ask if you would be interested in going to Mars, like if you had a chance no. or <laughs> let me just let me just break it down like as a yeah. first generation immigrant we're just trying to survive with what we have every day let alone go to mars like we we're not at the place where we could say i'm going to mars like my parents struggled way too hard for me to say i died in a, a space yeah, yeah. It's, it's just, yeah fair enough fair enough even my kids do Okay, that's interesting. You know, when I was so when I was kind of reading about this news and I was reading about some kind of ancillary topics around this as well, I came across this video and it had the the Winklevoss twins kind of talking about SpaceX and Mars. And tell me if you kind of heard something about this, but apparently one of the things that Elon wants to do is gonna go and mine meteorites for gold. And he was talk and, and the Wiggle Boston's were talking about how that's actually gonna help with the price of Bitcoin because you know, Bitcoin's kind of this finite this finite asset, whereas gold, you can continue to mine and stuff like that. So I thought that was really interesting. I just, in preparing for this conversation, I, I, I saw that, but I thought that was kind of... I Actually, now that you say that, I did see that, and that seems to be the beginning of every horror like movie. You go to, what, the Winklevoss twins in it? Or? You go up there, you go, yeah, I, I think I found gold, and then they crack it open, and they get, you know, body invasion, and that's yeah. how aliens happen. Hundred percent. I didn't even think of it like that, but that that probably makes it's kind of like the f around and find out yeah, version of uh, space exploration. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. I think that's how District Nine starts. It's like the guy, the guy cracks open the thing and he turns into whatever beast he turns into. Yep, yep. Well, I'm actually based on the the other news about kind of the aliens popping up out of the out of the oceans. That's like a whole other thing. Maybe for another episode, but it's. Uh, what a time to be alive, man. Yeah. If you want to hear about it, I mean, we can do the deep dive. If you want, comment below. I, I'm curious. Are other people interested in hearing about what, UAPs or UFOs coming out of the ocean? Like, hey, we're down the top. 100%. 100%. Um, so, yeah. So, we'll, we'll definitely be following that. Very interesting. I thought that, like, they might IPO kind of next year or the next few years. We'll see where Elon is. But... That that business that business is killing it, and they're becoming more and more entrenched within governmental bodies. So, Elon continues to continues to win there. The last the last headline from this from this week, not a major headline, but a story I came across on Bustle, and it's about the rise of side hustles in Gen Z. So, about seventy three percent of Gen Zers dream of doing a side hustle, and an equal percentage of them are are already incorporating like AI into their ventures. And 81% of Gen Z respondents want to explore side hustles alongside traditional jobs. So when they did the research, some of the key challenges right now for Gen Z, you know, in terms of job search and things going on with them, inflexibility, job security, lack of creativity. And they see these side hustles as a way of kind of unlocking that creativity and AI being a secret weapon. So 69% of Gen Z side hustlers rely on AI as their first resource for improving productivity and creativity. And 75% say AI makes them you know, more effective and helps them save time with repetitive tasks. You and I have talked about this a lot, you know, how we're using some of these AI tools daily and trying to learn, and that kind of helps uh, with what we're doing. I'm sure we're even incorporating you know, AI into like the creation of these videos, et cetera. What do you think about these trends within you know, Gen Z and AI and, and side hustles and kind of have the confluence of all those things? Yeah. I think it makes sense. I'd love to hear from other people too. If you have a side hustle, leave the link in our comments. Maybe we'll we'll help you promote it too. Like we'll, we'll take a look, have you come on. But if you have a side hustle that you're thinking about or doing, it seems like all the rage. My ultimate question is: Is doing the side hustle just adding more work, like more work to your plate? And that you could have done a better job with your main job and had the same success. Net, yeah. I don't know. Like that, that's a question that I always ponder. Like people, you know, a lot of these side hustles are very short term. You know, they're trying to catch a, a, a sort of a, 
a lightning in a bottle with you know e-commerce or drop shipping or you know yeah. these things that seem to like short term have a window and then they die down um, but people probably learn a ton from them as well like me and you've done little things here and there to, to earn a big buck and it's it's fun you learn a lot but I ultimately i don't know what they actually provide long term like how many really incredible businesses come out of side hustles yeah that'd be an interesting stat i'd love to hear i think that's a fair point i think that one of the challenges that exists right now in this current economic environment is there's so much uncertainty along a lot of the career paths that you know many folks within gen z have chosen specifically you know within tech in, in, in particular because that was supposed to be well, if you get one of these jobs in computer science or something tech adjacent you're going to be you're going to be set that is no longer the case. It's no longer it's no longer secure. So I think that like the side hustles, I agree with your point. There's a lot of learning, et cetera. But I also believe that you kind of have to be building a personal brand, leveraging these tools, kind of figure out other ways to make money because I don't think there's going to be the same job stability. I also think that leveraging these tools within the context of trying to build something out just makes you sharper on the new technology and new wave of stuff. And it's just like, a good way to stay on top of the trends and, and new, new enhancements and platforms. So do you see a future in which your regular full-time job is actually your side hustle <laughs> and your side hustle is your main job? I, I think, I think so. I think a lot of people are doing that. I mean, when I look five, 10 years out, I see tech companies, you know, getting fit, becoming smaller. I see startups that are getting funding now being much smaller teams having to monetize, you know, earlier and trying to like stay fit. And what that suggests to me is that the size of companies is not going to be as large and you're going to, but there'll still be a lot of startups. It'll still be, e they'll be easier to create one. So I almost see a world where you are, you know, it's like contracting, but you're basically just splitting your time between a number of different companies. And that becomes more of the norm as opposed to just being at, at one company, because Frankly, those companies don't need as many employees. So that's kind of how I see the world and where things are heading, but I could be wrong. Yeah. I mean, from what I've seen, the side hustles evolution kind of splits between I want to do this for a little bit, make money, and then it's I don't know where this goes. And then it turns into freelancing or advising or aqua hire or, you, you know, a passion project that turns into a full time job long, long term, which all are great outcomes. Don't get me wrong. Um, but rarely do I see like side hustle turn into full time enterprise hiring a bunch of people. It usually turns into like or consulting. I think is the best case. Yeah, where they're doing consulting work and hiring that way. But it is cool. I I love it. I love the hustle. I think yeah, it's a great definitely way for everyone to learn and get your, get your hands. I think so. I think I think you can't you can't be complacent in this world. Just things are everything's evolving so quickly. So. Hopefully we're providing a, a helpful resource and we'll continue to talk about things that we find and, and technologies. Obviously, we're going to stay on top of the most recent headlines. And, um, you can follow my, my, my LinkedIn. Every day I post new articles on there if you're particularly interested in consumer tech. Yeah, man, I think I don't think you can rest on any laurels or, or, not, be, or not be leaned in. And I think the other generation recognizes that. The younger yeah, do you, do you find using like AI and chat GPT at your job is like cheating on a test or are you just, do you do it openly? I don't think it's, I don't think it's cheating on a test. I think most people are using these tools now. I think, you know, when I, I used to think of AI as frankly, just replacing folks and there's some of that that can happen, but I think more of what it's going to be is just a co-pilot. So it just makes you more effective and efficient and We've talked about this. I think it gets you to kind of 50 to 60%. And that's great. I think that's better for the employees. I think that's better for the companies. You know, there's something to be said about the job displacement that's happening. And that's, so that's not great. And we're going to have to kind of evolve as a, as a species in some ways relative to all the different parts of the economy it will impact. But I don't necessarily see it as cheating. I just see it as, hey, this is the new wave of, of where things are. And you got to get with the times or, you know, get left behind. I think at first I felt like it was like, oh, I shouldn't check it because it seems inauthentic. But now I'm more like using it as a tool, research tool. Yeah, I think it depends on what you use it for. If you're just kind of like copy pasting stuff and it's not any kind of originality, one, I don't, you know, 
I, you know, you could say there's something maybe wrong about that, but also I just think the quality isn't great. At some point, three years from now, it will just be perfect. And right. It will and be totally, you know, unrecognizable for from anything else that you, that you or I would have put together. But uh, for now, I just think if you're only relying on that, it's not going to, you're not going to get a good product. Out. But once you do, shoot, use it, man. Why not? I mean, you know, especially if it's being trained off of like your, past work and experiences and insights, et cetera, if it can kind of do things out that, you know, more or less help you get faster to a uh, answer that you would have had anyway, like, why not? Yeah. I've heard, and then lots of big companies have their own version of it in chat GPT where it'll, it'll sort of consolidate and, and pull together company information so you, you can actually use it properly in a uh, share sensitive information. So I feel like that's a great option for, for companies too. That's like, hey, here you go. We're going to put the uh, privacy barriers up for you and give you the tools to be more efficient. Yeah. I think that we're heading to, you know, we're just going to be a more creative, flexible workforce generally. And part of that is just based off of people going to need to figure it out right now because, you know, there are going to be less opportunities. And the other part is that's just the way that the kind of tools and platforms and everything are evolving. And so in a lot of ways, that's exciting. And in and, and a lot of ways, that's daunting. But it's some, hopefully some of the things that we discuss here can be a good resource. Because I think, as we always talk about, we want to be good stewards of, of our community and share resources. Yeah. Let you know what to do. Like and subscribe below. Comments, feedback. Leave them down. We're here for you. And uh, if not, we'll see you in the next. Yes, sir. Three.